Welcome to DEF CON 3. I'm KT McFarland. Tuesday's power failure in Washington has once again raised questions about America's electric power grid. How secure is it? Could terrorists target the grid? What about hackers? Well, while there's no suggestion at this point that the outage was terrorism related, it's a vivid example of how quickly things can go very wrong if the electricity goes out. Joining us to discuss are Darren Hamill, Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder of Princeton Power Systems, and Jonathan Pollitt, Founder of Red Tiger Security. Jonathan, let me turn to you first. Um, what happened in Washington? Okay, so basically a, a high voltage transmission line failed and all of the power had to go somewhere. So it was rerouted to a neighboring transmission lines, which was caused a very large surge. And uh, it, it basically just caused a cascading effect. So what happens with transmission lines is you have old over voltage and under voltage uh, settings on these lines. And if the power goes either above or below the threshold, it will automatically try to save the grid by moving that power onto neighboring lines. And of course, then that moves on to the next neighboring line and the next neighboring line, and then you get this cascading effect. Okay, so a lot of fuses blew, basically. Um, let me ask you, how vulnerable is the infrastructure? It is very vulnerable, whether it's physical attacks, mistakes like this one, mm -hmm. or even cyber attacks, or even weather-related events. There, there have been a lot of high uh, visibility outages lately. And this is just another and, and more that we can expect to come. You know, Jonathan, one thing that, that strikes me is that we, we have an old infrastructure, right? This is a lot of it. It was 100 years old. Is there anything that's an easy and cheap fix to protect us from any kind of, like you said, you know, accidents, inadvertent ha hacker attacks, or even just, you know, an electric storm? Well, uh, you know, the grid is actually fairly robust in that the, the way it was designed, uh, the system will redirect power. Um, but the problem is uh, we've taken this old infrastructure um, and only upgraded the computer technology and switches, routers, and firewalls. The infrastructure has been modernized, but the actual assets are still old. Um, so what happened is we took an infrastructure that's older, and then we have this modernized, computerized equipment on top of it mm -hmm. that is vulnerable to the same type of hacking attacks that you see uh, with, with Target and all these major attacks you're seeing out there. The same types of attacks can affect the critical infrastructure if it's not protected properly. So we have to apply a very robust and mature set of cybersecurity controls to this critical infrastructure that was before uh, not connected to uh, computer technology. You know, um, when, uh, Darren, when the electric, we had an electric problem in the, in the grid and, and the West Coast a couple of, uh, last spring, and it was a physical attack. In other words, somebody breached the perimeter, attacked it, destroyed parts of it. But we're also talking about a hack attack. Now, somebody who's at nowhere near it, somebody who's a, a, you know, halfway around the world could attack it. So how do you defend against both of those, physical attack as well as cyber attack? Right. Well, part of the problem is that the grid is so interconnected that attacks on a small part can have these cascading failures. So part of the solution, we think, is distributed generation, uh, systems that generate power closer to where it's used. Uh, there are traditional backup power systems, but there are much more modern ways to invest in backup power. Mm -hmm. There has to be a lot of investment in the grid. I think most people agree. The question is, where do we spend that money? Okay, well, then let me turn to you, Jonathan. What kind of money are we talking about? Well, it depends on what you're trying to, uh, what type of problem you're trying to fix. Uh, is it a, is it, do you want the grid more robust or do you want it more secure? Uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, there was a large wave of investments that happened, uh, back, going back to 2007 when NERC SIP became law. So the biggest parts of the electric grid are now regulated for, uh, in terms of cybersecurity. Um, but then we're, we're going to see another uh, wave of spending coming out in the next few years because NERC SIP was just ratified to version 5. So we're going to see a big spending and uptake in cybersecurity in terms of perimeter protection, intrusion detection, intrusion response. And that's going to equate to a higher amount of availability, which does allow it to be a little bit more robust, at least from a cyber threat perspective. Uh, okay. Yeah, jump in, Jonathan. Go yeah, I, I want to be careful here, though. You know, we're talking about cyber attacks, which are right. important. But if you think about the attack in California, this was a group of individuals got to the site of a substation, and it, and it was a very well-coordinated but physical attack on a substation. So there are a lot, a lot of other ways that the grid can be taken. Okay, down. and I'm just an average individual, and my electricity goes out, and I have a generator in the basement. Is that going to help me? Jonathan, let me turn to you first. Is that going to help me? 
Uh, it will help you in terms of, uh, but you have to think about what types of systems are most critical for you. Uh, so most generators that you have in your backyard are going to run off of gasoline, and it's only going to be able to power only a small percentage of the things in your home. So if you have certain things such as uh, that are very important uh, in terms of your refrigerator, keeping food fresh, being able to cook and sustain your yourself, um, you may need to make sure that your generator has enough uh, power to support the appliances and things that you need. You also need to think about fuel because, uh, you know, I was uh, living in Texas during um, Hurricane Ike and we lost power for 13 days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the first couple of days you're thinking about, okay, how do I uh, eat down the food in my fridge? And then you're thinking, okay, how do I get additional gasoline from my generator? Because uh, it only is going to run for a few hours without having to be refilled. So then uh, you have limited gasoline sources because the power outage affects the, the ability of the gasoline stations to, to sell you gas. So now you're, you're spending your entire day driving your, your, your car around looking for gas. So um, fuel source and a big enough generator will save you. And uh, there are some systems that allow you to tap into natural gas. So basically you don't have to drive around for fuel. Um, and I would certainly advocate that you try to think about the uh, those uh, redundant supply systems. Well, let me turn right. to you for the final word, Darren. How am I going to stay safe from an electric power failure? Sure. So generators are one way, but there are better ways. There are new batteries, new types of generators, solar power, other distributed generation that can really help. These generators, diesel backups, were really only designed to run for a couple of days. So if we're talking about prolonged outages, which I think is what people are most mm -hmm. worried about, uh, we need to be smart about how we spend our investment. I think that's called smart power. Darren and Jonathan, thanks. And check out foxnews.com for more on this developing story. I'm Katie McFarland. Thanks for watching DEFCON 3.